Hello and welcome to the second in our tape series. We are going on a guided tour through the Lazeria map collection. We do not have enough time to show every map. However, we will look at some very old maps, as well as some new maps, some old map books, and some new map books. Together, we will carefully examine some of the rarest and strangest maps in the world. This program is intended to be scholarly because it is based entirely on fact. However, your own conclusions will determine whether or not you believe what you see is true. It will not take a cartologist to appreciate and understand these maps. However, it would be necessary to have some interest in factual history. We would like for this program to cause you to think and challenge certain principles that you've been taught. We would like for you to ask questions that you never dreamed of asking before. To begin our journey, we're going to go back to the year 1805. All right, the first map we're going to show you is from 1805, and it is an Aerosmith Lewis. You'll notice it is a black and white map. And we start to see a couple of names crop up. Right here we have Davis C. And Davis explored this region from 1585 to 1587. And here, of course, you'll notice the Hudson Sea, Hudson Straits. And Henry Hudson was in this area in the 1610, 1611 time frame. You notice right here, Southampton Island is actually a peninsula. And for some reason, Southampton Island is a peninsula on virtually, virtually every map of North America that was done between the years 1650 and 1820. Now, right here we have Greenland, and we have a huge white expanse here, which we're assuming is unexplored, unknown. We don't see a lot of detail in these islands right here in this area. It just looks like a, a horn going up north of the Hudson Bay, attaching itself to the body of the continent. But as we'll see later, there are a bunch of islands here. And coming over to this area, you'll notice the country of Alaska, this area, the territory of Alaska, doesn't have a name. But the word Alaska does appear right here at the Aleutian Islands. That's the only place Alaska is listed. This was a respected map in its day. It was perhaps published in small atlases for basic high school college reference work. It is an 1805 Aerosmith Lewis. Okay, the next map we're going to show you is a J.H. Colton from 1855. Now, Colton was well known for his fine embroideries of all of his engravings and printings. Absolutely beautiful. And his accuracy was well detailed, too. You'll notice the Gulf of Mexico here, Central America, Eastern Coast of North America, the West Coast of North America. Right here you'll notice is British Possessions. And right here it says United States. Now we're going to look a little closer in this area. Starting here with Greenland. Greenland has a new shape. But it stops right up here. And we have a few more names. There's Fobisher, who was in this area in the 1570s. And Baffin Bay, Baffin, of course, was here in the early 1600s. You'll notice Southampton Island is now an island. That's pretty accurate. And Hudson Bay looks well detailed. And there are a couple of important rivers that go into Hudson Bay. And you'll notice in this area the islands are starting to break up more. Perhaps revealing a northwest passage through here. And right over here, we come to Russian America. The word Alaska can only be found right here where the Aleutians are. And back up here, 
you will notice an expanse of white which we are assuming is unexplored. Now a couple of years before this map was printed there was an explorer named Robert McClure who'd said he'd traveled through the Northwest Passage and he was the first. But there are other accounts way before then such as the one in 1595 when the merchant trader Michael Locke reported that he'd met up with an old Greek sailor in Venice and this Greek sailor had told him that he had been through the Northwest Passage in 1592. Now there was a lot of controversy when this map was made concerning the Northwest Passage and in 1845 there was an expedition launched by Sir John Franklin he set out to look for the Northwest Passage but he and his crew and his ship vanished never to be seen again once again this is a beautiful full-color map from 1855 by J. H. Colton our next map is a full-color Johnson Ward printed in 1862 at the height of the uncivil war let's notice the same things we've noticed in some of the other maps coastline eastern North America looks very good Florida the west coast is very accurate the Hudson Bay is even more accurate Southampton Island is actually much larger Hudson Strait. We can see the detail on all these islands through here. Perhaps a couple of ways that a sailor and explorer could get through the Northwest Passage. Looking over here at Greenland, the east coast of Greenland is somewhat very undefined. There's a couple of new apparitions, some new inlets in Greenland. And here we have the expanse of white again. And coming down to Alaska, we still have Russian possessions. And the word Alaska is only on the Aleutians. Now our history books tell us that in 1867, Alaska was purchased by the United States from Russia. But that's not really true. The United States actually purchased Alaska from the Russian American Fur Trading Company. The Russian American Fur Trading Company owned this entire region. It was a company. The Eskimo originally inhabited this area. In 1867, when Alaska was purchased, there were 26,500 native Eskimo and less than 1,400 fur trading workers. The territory was purchased for $7,200,000. I wonder how much they gave the Eskimo for that. Once again, this is a map crafted in 1862 by Johnson and Ward. Our next map was crafted in 1873 by J. David Williams. This is also a beautiful full color map. United States. Many of the states are starting to take their modern day shapes. And we have a lot more detail in this area. Now we see literally hundreds of islands and many, many different passageways through these islands. We might ask how come other explorers didn't know this region had so many islands and passageways. But most every one of them are named after some explorer from one time period or another. 
Back up here, we see the east coast of Greenland is starting to take its shape. We stop right here on Greenland, except for this area. Of course, we have again our huge white expanse of what we are believing is unexplored territory at the time. Alaska is now called United States Territory. The search for the Northwest Passage at this time kind of took a back seat to the fact that the Suez Canal opened up and at the same time we are told that explorers ceased to look for the Northeast Passage also. Going back in 1905 Royal Admondson traversed the Northwest Passage going close to the North Pole up in the Arctic Ocean but there are earlier accounts as well as the ones mentioned previously in 1640 there supposedly was an Admiral Fonte de Fuca who claimed that he'd sailed through the Northwest Passage not once but twice and in the mid 1700s there were several accounts given many different explorers and sailors stating that they had been through the Northwest Passage most every one of the early explorers claimed of seeing open polar seas in this area vast bodies of water in 1652, a gentleman named Joseph Moxon recorded that he had met up with a Dutch sailor who had just returned from a voyage to the North Pole, stating that the vessel he was on had achieved two degrees beyond the North Pole, where they came upon an open sea. The weather had changed quite suddenly, and his quote was, it was as warm as Amsterdam in the summer. Once again, this is from 1873, a J. David Williams. Our next map is of Antarctica. This is a map from 1906. A couple of things of interest. There are many explorers who's out of the Cape Horn, originating, coming all the way around here, South America right here, and the distance here is nowhere near as much as it actually ended up being on the modern maps. And out of the uh, early explorers to the Antarctic, this particular map shows the travels of Bruce in 1904 the travels of Scott his two voyages 1903 and 1902 and as you can see there were other explorers in here but for some reason the coastline of Antarctica is very vague there's actually places where there are two or three coastlines let's assume that it was because of ice flow and drift and glacial activity. And we're just going to flip this map over. And show the Arctic region. And here we can begin to see all of these explorers here. It wasn't a question at this time in 1906 whether or not there was a Northwest Passage. The elusive Northwest Passage as well as the Northeast Passage was no big deal. Had several explorers. There were explorers in this entire area many times over. This map shows Nansen's trip, 18, 1895 shows Robert McClure's journey the 1850s 
shows Cagney's journey of 1900. Very intricately done, smaller map. See all these islands down here? Alaska. This is from 1906. Our next map doesn't have a date on it. It's a small map also, black and white. And for a couple of reasons, it's one of my favorites. The date I'm going to attach to it is between 1910 and 1912 because of the journeys that it shows. It includes on this map the journey of Perry in 1909. Now, this map indicates that Perry left here, north of Greenland, and went straight to the North Pole and straight back. I find that extremely peculiar, even by today's explorers, to go straight to a point and then come straight back. It's virtually impossible. Another peculiarity of this and other polar region, North Polar Region maps is that they fail to mention the journeys of Frederick Cook. Frederick Cook claimed that he'd gotten to the North Pole before Perry. And when they were before Congress, the two of them proved without any question that neither one of them had gotten to the North Pole. Another peculiarity with this map is that in this area right here, in 1881, the Jeannette was crushed. The commander of the Jeannette was DeLong. DeLong and his men died in Siberia, but the wreckage of the Jeannette drifted. This line right here says, the drift line of the Jeannette wreckage. The Jeannette wrecked here and then drifted all the way down through the North Pole coming down this way all the way to the southern tip of Greenland. The wreckage traveled 3,500 miles and if we are to believe that this is all polar ice cap. How did this boat, this ship that wrecked, drift 3,500 miles down here? Once again, this is a North Polar Region map from approximately 1912. Now we're going to show you an old book this is a very old book. It's almost 300 years old. We're showing this because many of our scholar friends wanted to see this when they found out that it was in the collection. Voyages and Travels in four volumes. And if we can see the date down here, 1704. A Voyage Round the World by Dr. John Francis Gemelli Carreri. The map that we're going to show you from this book is of Greenland. Towards the end of the book, we find this beautifully detailed map of Greenland. Several items of interest. Here's an island which perhaps could be Grotland. Greenland, the east coast of Greenland, 
and it shows a body of land right here and over here says which is land The story in this book is an account of eight men who were stranded in Greenland for nine months and twelve days. And there are many, many fascinating stories that these gentlemen recorded. One of the most interesting was when they were starved, on the verge of starvation. They heard something outside their tent and they ran out and saw a mother bear with her cub. And as soon as they saw the bear, the bear saw them, and they charged each other. Six of the men with their lances, pikes, spears, swords, whatever, ran to meet the bear. She saw food, and they saw food. So the charge was on. And when they met in the middle, there was a furious battle. A lot of blood but the six sailors who were stranded did manage to kill the bear the cub ran off and they ate the meat as they would and left the rest to just freeze until it was all gone with the exception of the liver and the men thinking that more food would come up left the liver for the last part and since they had no food at that time, they ate the liver of this bear. And about two days later, all of their skin fell off. This is a classic example of an overdose of vitamin A. Once again, this is a map of Greenland from a book published in London in the year 1704. All right, we're gonna take a look now for a few minutes at just a typical globe that you could find in most any high school library. You'll notice Greenland right here. Greenland was supposedly discovered in 1070 by the Nordic explorers at which time they called it Vinland but there were also other places in Canada along the coast here that at one time or another were called Vinland in 1854 there was an explorer named Kent Kane who made it to the north of Greenland here and he got out of the ship went to the tallest cliffs on the coast and he looked out and he recorded that he saw vast open polar sea with no ice and heavy breakers but before this time we are taught that everyone thought the world was flat. If we look a little bit closer, we can find that Julius Caesar in 50 BC had a problem with the old Roman calendar, which consisted of 355 days in its solar year. Julius Caesar chose to make the new Roman calendar with 365 days in the year and every fourth year a leap year was added to the end of February and what does that tell us that tell us that tells us that Julius Caesar with his experts knew that not only was the earth round but it took 365 days to circumnavigate the Sun They also were fully aware that there were almost 24 hours in a given day. This causes a problem with the dogma of the Middle Ages 
stating that the world was thought to be flat. Now we're going to look at some old maps written in Latin and we're going to bring up our Latin expert Paul Vanetti. Now I would like to show you a 1507 map printed by Johannes Ruysch of Amsterdam of the geography of Ptolemy. It is very important to understand that throughout the Middle Ages and late into the 1400s and 1500s, Latin was the predominant language for Western Europe was run by the Catholic Church and therefore all intellectuals had to know Latin and it was the only language for which all Catholic intellectuals could communicate with one another. It is also very important to understand that in the late 1300s there were many prominent Portuguese sailors and up into the 1400s many from Spain and Holland who began sailing out into the Atlantic Ocean and into the Pacific Ocean in order to find trade routes to the east. Now in order for them to be able to navigate they had to learn basic geography and cartography. And the major cartographic maps they used at that time were those maps coming from the geography of Claudius Ptolemy. Claudius Ptolemy was from Alexandria and lived from 90 AD to 160 AD. Through his brilliancy he was able to copy a large portion of the globe and he figured out a method of calculations to put a sphere on parchment and retain accurate measurements. He was able to map out most of Europe, Africa and Asia and he was able to calculate degrees latitude and longitude and he also figured out that the earth was tilted at 23 and a half degrees. So that was back in the first century AD and the map was and the world was mapped as if it were a sphere. So therefore in the 13 and 1400s all these sailors and explorers knew that the earth was round. This map is a copy from a Dover publishing company book called Claudius Ptolemy the Geography and it can be obtained in any bookstore. This particular 1507 map was drawn with all the knowledge of exploration at that time and all the coordinates that were brought forth by Claudius Ptolemy were included in that map and any new lands discovered were added. There's some very interesting points in this 1507 map. It is one of the first maps that shows the newly discovered lands in the Americas. Let us home in on this area down here known as Terra Sancta Crucis. As you can see, it is actually a detailed description of the northern coast of South America which was explored and mapped in the late 1490s. You can see the winding of the continent, what is now Brazil, and going further down south. And up here you notice the islands of the Caribbean, island of Hispaniola which Christopher Columbus was on, as well as the Antilles. And over here you see a portion of another island which could possibly be Cuba, or it could be a portion of Mexico. One thing that was very significant then using the measurements of Claudius Ptolemy was that they believed that all these newly discovered lands belonged to the Asian continent. Now let us go slightly further north here. As you can see as you sail westwards from Europe you encounter a portion of land here in the north which had been discovered at that time and this is what could be a portion of North America. This portion right here could be a portion of Newfoundland or maybe even Cape Cod. 
but this is a, actually resembles a portion of North America. Then down here, this resembles a portion of Asia and China. So they believe that the new continent they discovered was actually a part of Asia. One way, let's read how this area here is described in the Terra Santa Crucis. It actually translates to the land of the Sacred Southern Cross, or New World. This paragraph here talks about when the first explorers landed, they could see a savage race of natives in there that were headhunters and cannibals, and the climate was extremely harsh and tropical. It's a very good welcome to the New World. Further south, this little sentence here describes how Portuguese sailors entered a frigid zone and were able to reach the 90th degree or the South Pole. Could it be possible that 400 years ago, Portuguese sailors actually reached the Antarctic Pole and beat Scott and Amundsen? Let us now show briefly the continent of Africa. You can see the African continent is in great detail. And at, by 1507, numerous Portuguese explorers and traders, as well as Spaniards, have been able to circumnavigate Africa in search of the Spice Islands in the east. It was a very important trade route. Over here you see Madagascar and some of the islands in India. And also, let us go over all the way to Asia. And it shows several very nice islands such as Java Mayor, Java Minor. And these islands here are described as very rich gold producing and spice producing islands, which were the goal of most of these sailors in order to gather the spices and gold in order to trade. Also up here is a small description of China. And they also describe a small island called Chipango, which is the modern Japan. And they talk about uh, people living there that are not very friendly. And the country itself is divided in several small kingdoms with all these little kings fighting one another. It can remind you of the shoguns of Japan, which were prevalent at that time. Okay, over here, it's a pretty good map of India. And as it goes further down, you can see it vined, which could be part of Burma. And to the south of India, there's an island here. And the script here describes that on that island lived the people that were famous for being diplomats. They learned many languages, and their people became ambassadors to all the countries in the Near and the Far East. Let us look like here to the text. And this is a very detailed text describing the different climatic regions and also the different areas where there's maximum and minimum daylight hours and the divisions of day and night. Very accurately mapped details. And they had a lot of knowledge back then. Now let us look up here to the north. You can see four islands and a multitude of channels going through right to the North Pole, which appears to be a circular sea. This is very significant. Keep that in mind. You must also understand that these maps of the geography of Ptolemy were used by Christopher Columbus and other explorers of his time. The significance of the map is that it was one of the last maps that shows the New World and Asia connected. In later editions, you see a difference. You see the New World showing all by itself, and that came about after 1521, after Ferdinand Magellan circumnavigated the globe 
and proven that the New World was separate from the Asian continent. Okay, now we're going to take a small break and we're going to feature a couple of books and this is one of them. The Mapping of North America by John Goss. It is a Rand McNally publication and can be purchased at most any bookstore or special ordered for less than a hundred dollars. We're going to refer to this book. Okay, the first map that we're going to show you from this book is on page 35. And it is a copy of the map engraved in 1570 by a very famous map maker named Abraham Ortilius. This map shows North America and South America. Gulf of Mexico here. The Hudson Bay here. And all the way over here we see that tiny island of Friesland. Right here. You see Greenland right here? And Friesland. Right here, in the upper corner. It's a very beautiful map. Crafted in 1570. This is not an original. This is a copy taken from the book, The Mapping of North America. Moving right along, the next map we're going to show you from the same book was done in 1594 by Dotacom. Now, a couple of things of significance here. This was a well-respected navigational map, as you can see, with all the lines traversing the ocean. There's a huge, beautiful sea monster right here. And uh, right up here, we're going to look at Greenland first. This is the west coast of Greenland and the east coast of Greenland going up through here. Right here is Iceland and right here is Friesland again. You will notice there are about 13 different cities and towns places recorded on Friesland. Again, this is a 1594 copy from the book, The Mapping of North America, by John Goss. This is a Dotacom. We are also in this presentation going to feature several maps from this book, also by John Goss, The Map Maker's Art, a Rand McNally publication. This book can also be purchased at most any reputable bookstore or special order for perhaps less than a hundred dollars. The first map from this book that we're going to feature is found on pages 97 and 98. And we're going to bring into the picture a cartographer of old named Gerard Mercator who lived from the year 1512 to 1594. This particular map, very beautiful map, was engraved by his grandson, one of his grandsons, named Romald Mercator. This map was engraved in 1587. Gerard Mercator was recognized for his brilliant ability to make maps. He was very highly respected throughout Northern Europe. In 1577, Gerard Mercator wrote a letter to Dr. John Dees explaining that there were four rivers 
up in the northern region they had a very strong flow this flow was inward towards the North Pole and when sailors got trapped in these rivers there was virtually no way to get out John Dees will point out was somewhat of a 16th century Aleister Crowley he was into the occult and mysticism magic he was tried and convicted of using magic there are many texts on this map of 1587 done by Romuald Mercator patterned entirely after his grandfather's map of 1569 which at that time was the most famous world map in all of Europe now we're going to examine some of these scripts on this map there is an important difference in this map of the late 1500s to the Ptolemaic maps of the early 1500s so you notice there is a division of the western and the eastern hemisphere and you can clearly see that the North American continent is separated from Asia there's also a discovery recently made at that time of a new southern continent known as Terra Australis. Let us now examine some of the important script on this map. Let us go to New Guinea. This reads that the island of New Guinea is a recently discovered island and it was once believed that it could have been part of Terra Australis. Below it shows this landmass was named after its discoverer Ferdinand Magellan and is also called occasionally Terra Magellanica instead of Terra Australis named after Ferdinand Magellan. As we go further eastwards we see a landmass here known as Terra del Fuego and it was believed that this southern tip of South America was part of this continent of Terra Australis. Now as we go further to the other hemisphere, this sentence here clearly states a distance between this point of Terra Australis to the Cape of Good Hope in Southern Africa is approximately 450 leagues distance which is actually about 1300 miles so sailors have reached the Antarctic continent another good piece of evidence to that is that in this paragraph sentence here states that Portuguese sailors encountered birds of an enormous size they must have been describing the penguins on Antarctica over here it describes that between the islands of St. Lorenz and Los Romeros there is a current which changes occasionally in direction from clockwise to counterclockwise between this and Los St. Lorenz which is today's Madagascar and this little island of Los Romeros further inland here describes that these vast areas are written about in a book by Mark Paolo Venetti and Ludwig Wartemann. There's some other descriptions of this Terra Australis up here. Up here it describes a gold producing province and further south a land of many or multiple aromas, land of wild flowers. Now it's important to note that they believed what could have been a discovery of what is known as Australia today which is tropical they probably believed at that time that it was a complete part of the Terra Australis or Antarctica they were all one continent over here it describes an island of many riches and spices one of the south islands of the western explorers and traders and it also shows a multitude of islands known as spice islands in the east let us go to North America 
and this text here reads America or New India discovered in 1492 by Christopher Columbus and claimed for the Kingdom of Castile. Now let us go to the far north and it shows four islands one, two, three, four four islands crisscrossed by rivers. This paragraph here describes that between these four islands are four rivers that flow in a northward direction and empty into a central sea around the pole up here. Over here on this island the description reads that is the healthiest island in the north. Now let us go to the northern part of the eastern hemisphere. This island is described as having inhabitants that are four foot tall, which they call pygmies. And over on this island, it gives a description of this river here. And it describes that this river has such a strong current flowing northwards that it never freezes throughout the whole year. A very interesting and advanced map for its time. Okay, now we're going to see some more of Gerard Mercator's work. This map is on page 86 and half of 87 in the book Mapmaker's Art. Many significant things concerning this map. It is one of Gerard Mercator's most famous maps. You'll notice this is the northern hemisphere with the 90th parallel being in the center. You will also notice that there is a navigational meridian placed here. We'll find out why later. You will notice here the detail of the Hudson Bay. And right here, we have Southampton Island. No question about it. This right here is the northern coast of North America. This is the northern coast coming over to Alaska. Point Barrow is about right here and this Alaska is upside down and it is missing the very important Aleutians. It is called the region of California as was the entire west coast of North America. Right here we have what later became the Bering Straits, northern Siberia, Nova Zembla, northern Europe, Spitzenbergen right here, and right here we can see a very detailed map, very detailed, very accurate, of the coastline of Norway. And if you look right down here, you can see the tip of Scotland. Iceland is right here. Moving over, we see Friesland again. And we can see also that right here is the 350th meridian line and we can come up a little bit more for many years it was believed that Greenland had a large island at its southern tip which was not true and here is Greenland and up here in this corner the upper left hand corner of the map we find again Friesland but it's in much more detail now. All these wonderful places. There's little castles here. Tiny villages. And Friesland is well documented. Now we're going to look at the script contained in these four islands, which we will see are called the Bargos Islands with a mysterious 
apparition here in the center. Let me describe to you the script that is on the landmass in the north. First, let us go up here. This describes the north magnetic pole. Let us now go to the physical pole in dead center. It says Rupes Nigra et Altissima. Describes a very dark and high canyon right in the middle of the pole. Let us now go to this island over here at the top left. It describes that from the ocean there enter four rivers that flow northwards into the pole and there are 19 openings from those rivers into the ocean. These rivers flow northward and empty into the central sea and then empty into the very dark mountain or canyon and they empty into the inner earth. This canyon is approximately 33 leagues wide which is, I believe, about a hundred miles. Now let us go down here. This describes that this is the healthiest and most fabulous island in the north. This here describes that this river or channel flows northwards and is divided and it has three openings into the outer sea and this particular channel is approximately 37 leagues wide. Over here on this island it describes that here live small people or pygmies about four foot tall which are called Skrelingers in Greenland. Now over here it describes that this particular river, its flow is so great northwards that it never freezes during the year. Over here, it describes that in this part of the north lie the Bargo Islands, which can be read in the book by Paolo Venetti, and they circle the pole and the sea. Another significant thing about this particular river here is that it only freezes three months out of the year. It is blocked right there, three months out of the year. Now let us go further down here to the Hudson Bay. You already described this island as Southampton Island. It describes that this particular sea is made of fresh water and its extent is unknown to its natives in Canada. A very detailed map by Gerard Makeda. The next map that we're going to show you is a Michael Mercator map from 1595 and it was used up to 1636. Michael Mercator was also a grandson of Gerard Mercator. As you can see he was a brilliant engraver. Now we are not sure if he was a cousin or a brother to Romald Mercator but they had to be one or the other many significant things of this map as you can see it shows the western hemisphere we have terra australis down here north america here south america here this is a plaque that we found at an antique store no one there knew what it was but we did and we picked it up very cheap the script in the New Guinea section is virtually the same as what we read you earlier. The script here in Terra Australis 
is also the same. You can see the space between the two getting wider. We have the same script up here in North America concerning Christopher Columbus. Up to the north, once again, we have the Bargo of Silence. And over here, we have a script that tells how the Amazon River had been completely discovered and mapped. Once again, this map was printed in several different editions from the year 1595 up to 1636. This is indeed one of the latter renditions of the map. It is also important to point out that this map has Friesland right here in the far top corner, top edge. Well-crafted map by Michael Mercator, grandson of Gerard Mercator. Okay, we're quickly going to show you several other very famous maps that featured Friesland. This is taken from page 62 of Mapping of North America by John Goss. And this map was used widely between 1627 and 1676. It is the first English map. It is done by John Speed and printed in London. And it does feature Friesland in the upper corner. The next page will show the famous Blau map of 1630. It also has Friesland up here, the upper edge, and then again on page 64 we have a Hendrik Hondius map which also shows Friesland, the upper border, and Hondius tutored under the great Gerard Mercator. Now we're going to enter into the picture a very famous engraver and one of the most controversial figures of his time, Matthias Quattis. Matthias Quattis lived from 1557 to 1613. He was hailed as a brilliant geographer and a master engraver. His engraving style of maps was somewhat different from others. He took the known regions and mapped them as if they were on a cylinder, which made navigation by his maps easier. But at the same time, it distorted, distorted the northern and southern regions. There was a gentleman named Busemacher who printed his maps for him in various atlases and they operated out of Cologne, Germany. This map was crafted by Matthias Quattis in the year 1600. This was the year that Matthias Quattis was banned by the church. Now in the northern region here, you can see two huge bodies of land here and here and a region of water coming down right on in here as if it were a river. And now we're going to show you another controversial Matthias Quattis map. This is now an original 1600 Matthias Quattis manuscript from a small atlas printed by Busemacher. This is the reverse of the map. As you can see, it is mounted in double glass. This is Terra Australis. There are many significant things concerning this map. It is actually two maps. This right here shows the Straits of Magellan 
which are called Magellanarcum. This right here is Terra Australis, but it actually looks more like we know it today. Right here we have New Guinea. And this region right here to the north was called Terra del Fuego. And this right here is the northernmost tip of it. This being the Cape of Storms, South America. And as this was true with many of the Matthias Quadus maps, he enjoyed putting as much information on the front of the map as he possibly could. And we're going to examine this legend right here and point out some facts as they were interpreted then. Each one of these scripts, captions, is numbered to a corresponding position on the map. This is area number one. Area number one reads, These regions are extremely vast, as written by the foreigners Polos Vanetti and Ludwig Vottoman. Now going down here to number two, we find the gold-bearing province. And right above that it says beach. Right here at number three is the land of many aromas. Number four, right here, this being Africa and Madagascar. Between these islands, St. Lawrence and Romeros, it can be noticed that the flow of the ocean changes periodically. Number five, right here, says, here as noticed by the Portuguese, lie incredible looking birds of large size. And number six, right here, this region of Australis was named after its discoverer, Magellan. And number seven, right here, this land is a newly discovered island and it is uncertain whether it is part of Terra Australis. Shortly after this map was pressed, engraved, printed, whatever you prefer, Matthias Quadus was banned by the church for a time of making maps. But we can see that he was not banned for more than eight years. Now, we are going to look at the map that started all of this absurdity in our journeys back through time. This is again from 1600, an original Matthias Quadus engraving printed by Busemacher in Cologne, Germany. This map comes from a different atlas printed in 1608 by Busemacher, scripted by Matthias Quadus. The reverse of the map shows and explains in great detail many aspects of the Arctic region. We will read some of this as it is translated from Latin momentarily. Now we are going to show you the front of this original 1608 map done by Matthias Quadus. Here again we have a rendition of the Northern Hemisphere. There are many points of interest on this map. Many of them have already been covered. As you perhaps noticed with the Terra Australis map, much of the script that we translated had already been used on Mercator maps and other maps as well. This particular map goes into more detail concerning the North. And we are going to begin reading script with this paragraph right here. For your convenience, we have turned the map on its side. 
and it begins like this. Friesland is said to be larger than Ireland and was unknown to the ancients. The climate is extremely harsh. Inhabitants do not have any fruits but live on seafood. Furthermore, many of them have sailed throughout the ocean and brought their loaded ships to all maritime European cities and to many nations of Africa and Asia. During this period, English ships frequently went to Friesland and it became known as Western England. There you can find a maximum daylight of 19 hours. Now we have turned the map upside down showing the paragraph on the other side which says Greenland is an island which is quite unknown. Its inhabitants live off of winged game and fish. There exists a mountain just like Etna which constantly erupts and emits rocks in the form of hot cinders which when cooled become weak walls and when water is thrown against them it makes great lime or potash. In this same place there is a hot spring which its water is being used by a neighboring monastery of the Manachar order for the use of heating and cooking of food. It snows nine months out of the year during which time very little unfrozen land is visible. Now back to the center of the map. We're going to start with this section here and read exactly what it says. Four channels break up the island and they produce 19 mouths or openings to the outer ocean. The rivers flow to the north and empty into the inner earth. The canyon which lies beneath the pole is approximately 33 leagues wide which is about a hundred modern miles. The next section right here states very precisely in this part of the north exist the Bargo Islands according to M. Paul Valete book 2 chapter 61 these islands always rotate around the North Pole and the compass needles always point to the south. Part 2 right here states this channel has five openings and because of the speed of the flow it never freezes section three of the map also in two sections clearly states this island is the best and healthiest of the entire north this channel is composed of three openings, which are frozen approximately three months out of the year. Its width is 37 leagues, or roughly 111 modern miles. Section 4, right here. Here live pygmies, which are four feet tall and are called Skrelingers in Greenland. The script in the Hudson Bay is also identical several of the other maps stating this is a fresh water sea and its extent is unknown to the natives of Canada which we are assuming at that time were the Eskimo. Now on the back of this map the script is quite complete a lot of Greek mythology on how this area came to be. And we're going to start with the line that reads like this. Now to the main point. The large island is almost the shape of a circle, which has at its center a sea, which in its center lies the great dark canyon. Right there. This major island is partitioned into four smaller ones by four rivers flowing in a cross-like formation from the ocean into the central sea and they contain numerous small openings into the ocean. 
The descriptions on this map differ greatly from others, which only outline the well-known regions and do not mention this polar area. They mainly mention the area south of it and especially those areas around the equator. Nonetheless, in order to get to all these places using this map, it is necessary for you to include the north from where one can reach places in the east as well as in the west. It is also necessary to know that when in the North Pole, all directional points are reversed, and it is necessary to use a sextant. For example, when at the North Pole, in order to go south to Iceland, follow the compass pointing north. In order to go to America, follow the compass east. In order to get to Norway, follow the compass northwest. And in order to get to Friesland, allow the compass northeast. And to Ireland, which is not listed in this map, also go north. And in this fashion, it is possible to reach all the other regions, cities, islands, and bays which are located on this map. This is a noteworthy observation. Within the entire Arctic Circle, it is daylight for six months, and there is darkness for six months. And this day-night cycle happens yearly, which seems ridiculous and unbelievable to us Germans, Swabians, and Bavarians. Nevertheless, Ovid did not fall from grace, and these facts were given to me by many reliable eyewitnesses. But productivity can suffer on long nights due to excessive sleep. Therefore, the sailors utilize the splendid northern lights and the luminous moon and are fully supplied with flint, firewood, grease, and body oil. So most of the labor has to be done during the night and fishing for food during the twilight. Yet in the summertime, there is continuous daylight. But the time span of the days and hours is no different than ours. Now this is a very strange translation here. <clears throat> I will continue. The sound of bells is highly valued where it is desolate. Next sentence. There, the constant sun does not produce enough heat because it is never high enough to emit it. And wherever it is in the region, there is a lot of shade and the sun seems to always be setting. From information obtained by the observation of this area, if you want to find out the distance to a place by using this map, become acquainted with the capabilities of a sextant. Do not use the degree points on the outer edge of the circle, which circumference is approximately 30,000 German miles, or 20,000 modern miles. Continuing, but the use of the line which comes from the center of the map and intersects with the 290th. The distinct points of degrees which can be found condensed around the circumference must retain the same distance throughout the globe. We're going to stop there and point out a couple of things. If we can close in right here on the Hudson Bay and go to the detail, we can see Southampton Island much closer than the maps of the early 1800s. And we see these two important rivers coming in to the south of the Hudson Bay. Again, this is Alaska here, upside down without the Aleutians. This is the Bering Strait, Siberia, Nova Zemla, Spitzenbergen, Greenland, Iceland, Friesland, and all of the points circumnavigated are marked in the degrees as in the Ptolemaic tradition. If someone were going to put on a map the depths of the Hudson Bay, they would have had to have come up this way and gone down into the Bay region from the north and completely explored this area to know that there were two important rivers that came into the Hudson Bay here. There is virtually no other way that it could have been done. With the detail of this map going down to Nor Norway, again you see the fine detail of the Norwegian coast. And we can see just the tip end of Scotland right here. It is called Scotia. Iceland is very close to the way it exists today. Here is Friesland. 
And up here in the far right hand corner of the map, we have a very good picture of Friesland. Now it is much more detailed. You can see the North Gulf, the South Gulf. You can see all these castles and villages all around Friesland, as well as islands here and here. Back to the center of the map. <clears throat> if so much detail were to be given to the Norwegian coast by these respected scholars of cartography, Nova Zemla, all these regions, wouldn't it make sense that someone had been here before? Perhaps many explorers? They certainly had to be here for more than six months at a time if they knew that there were 19 hours of daylight. Could they have stopped at Friesland, used it as a port to gather more supplies and sail up through here? Here we see how just a tip end of Greenland is connected to this Fargo Island. Friesland, we can easily determine, sunk in the late 1600s. Many explorers after that took soundings and found that a large area of land under the ocean here was sinking. It was checked again as late as 1944 by two different cat admirals, soundings taken, and proved that there was an area approximately 27 miles in diameter that was only like 30 fathoms under the sea out in the middle of the ocean, the great depth of the North Sea. The historical map books indicate that Friesland was never a place, that it was mythological. And it was a, play, it was a figment of our imagination. But we have conducive evidence that states different. And oddly enough, out of all the maps that we have seen in this presentation, the Bargos Islands are perhaps the most mysterious. These Bargo Islands are never accounted for by any of the gentlemen who write such books as having been myth, uh, mythological or having sunk or anything other than the fact that we received from our textbooks that this entire region is covered with polar ice. Now perhaps if there was indeed a hole in the center of the earth at the top at the North Pole, is it possible that we could see this on a modern map? say perhaps a map taken from space? Let's examine the most modern map that can be purchased at any bookstore at a very cheap price and see what it has to offer. This is a modern map called the Earth from Space, a satellite view of the world. This map is a compilation of thousands of satellite photographs put together to give an image of the world without its cloud covers. So this is a map of the world without cloud cover. Now here on this map, let us take a look and see if we can find similarities to the Mercator map and the Quadras map of the Arctic area. One thing I would like to point out that this map clearly shows a Northwest Passage. Just come in here and you have a nice choice which route to take. Let's take this route here. I don't see any ice blocking my way. So therefore this one of the most modern maps today shows that the Northwest Passage exists. Now let us examine the Arctic area. Let us look for evidence of a central sea or possibly of this blue sea described in the Mercator and the Quadra, Quadros maps. Let us begin over here. All we see is a white patch of supposed ice. Let us home in over here. 
I find this spot very peculiar. It is like looking at a circle from a side view. This is a little stripe of blue in there. It is like looking at a circle from a sideway angle. It could be actually a blue sea. Let us look for other evidence. You notice to the north here, there's an open sea area. Let us go further and further and further. Ah, here. Here we see some blue, which could be part of this open sea. And further eastwards. Here you can clearly see a lot of blue. Blue open ocean water surrounded by ice. If this Arctic here was just an ice cap and it was so cold, why would there be blue open sea water smack in the middle of ice? This can only explain that it must be warmer at the pole or else there would not be open water. This is from the most modern satellite map of the world. You can get it in any bookstore or in most places. Now that we have seen famous maps of the cartographers of the yesteryear, let us now analyze what modern expert geologists and earth scientists tell us about the composition of the inside of the earth. This is a page out of a book that is a common geography book used in many of today's prominent universities. It is called Essentials of Geography and the picture I'm about to describe here is a picture you will see in most all modern geography books. This model here is based on what geographers use, what they call S and P waves that they send into the earth and what they determine its composition to be. They determined that we have a crust which is a hundred kilometers thick then that below it there is a mantle that is almost 3,000 kilometers thick. Then there's an outer core that is 2,270 kilometers thick. And then there's an inner core that is 1,260 kilometers thick. They describe under the mantle it's a hot liquidish area. And then as you get further towards the inner core, that the inner core is compi composed of nickel and iron and solids, a very hot area. This is what our experts of today say what the world in the earth is composed of. This is a cutoff of the globe showing how they send S&P waves and how they travel through and how they determine the composition of the earth. But these geography books also state that this is pure speculation and not fact but they believe this to be the most accurate theory. This is what's presented in today's books, but as, as we know, there has nobody actually been down there to describe the hot core and everything that is purely speculative. Now, let me give you some actual accounts of Arctic explorers. This is a quote from Lieutenant Hooper, Royal Navy, in an expedition from 1849 to 1850. He says, I've heard the Aurora Borealis, not once but many times, not faintly and indistinctly, but loudly and unmistakably, now from this quarter, now from that, now from one point on high, and another time from one low down. At first it seemed to resemble the sound of field ice, then it was like the sound of a watermill. 
and at last, like the whirring of cannon shot heard from a short distance. Dr. Fritjof Nansen, from his diary, volume 2, page 472. Wednesday, March 25th. There is the same dark water sky behind the promontory in the southwest, stretching thence westwards, almost to the extreme west. It has been there all through this mild weather with southwesterly wind, from the very beginning of the month. There seems to be always open water there, for no sooner is the sky overcast than the reflection of water appears in that quarter. The explorer Kane writes in his diary, As the surface of the glacier receded to the south, its face seemed unbroken with piles of earth and rock-stained rubbish, till far back in the interior it was hidden from me by the slope of a hill. Still beyond this, however, the white blink or glare of the sky above showed its continued extension. Another quote from Nansen. So in the meantime, we made fast to a great ice block and prepared to clean the boiler and shift coals. We are lying in open water with only a few large flows here and there, but I have a presentiment that this is our winter harbor. There's no reason why their progress should have stopped at that point. Another quote from Nansen. This island we came to seemed to me to be one of the most lovely spots on the face of the earth. A beautiful flat beach, an old strand lined with shells, strewn above a narrow belt of clean water along shore, where snails and sea urchins were visible at the bottom, and Amphipoda was swimming about. In the cliffs overhead were hundreds of screaming little arcs, and beside us, the snow bunting fluttered from stone to stone with their cheerful twitter. Here was life and fair land. We were no longer on the eternal drift ice. At the bottom of the sea, just beyond the beach, I could see whole forests of seaweed. Under the cliffs, here and there, were drifts of beautiful rose-colored snow. Another quote by Franklin, he saw large numbers of geese migrating to the unknown north at a high latitude indicating land there. He notes that no matter how far north the explorer goes, he always finds the polar bear ahead of him. No matter how far north these bears are met, they are always on their way north. At latitude 82, Kane found butterflies, bees, and flies as well as wolves, foxes, bears, geese, ducks, waterfowls, and partridges. A strange fact all explorers observe is that animals do not migrate south to escape the cold arctic winter, but instead go north. Nansen was puzzled by this driftwood, which is continually found along the Greenland coast. He said that as far north as latitude 86 degrees, he found such driftwood. Another account by Dr. Nansen on, on the occasion when the compass went haywire. Taking everything into calculation, if I am to be perfectly honest, I think this is a wretched state of matters. We are now in about 80 degrees north latitude. In September, we were in 79 degrees. That is, let us say, one degree for five months. If we go on at this rate, we shall be at the pole in 45 or say 50 months, and in 90 or 100 months at 80 degrees north latitude on the other side of it, with probably some prospect of getting out of the ice and home in a month or two more. At best, if things go, on as they are going now, we shall be home in eight years. Because of Dr. Nansen, 
finding it getting warmer near the Untal Pole, and as well as his compass acting strange, he decided to turn around because he felt he was lost and went back home and ended his vision. Here is an account from another Nordic explorer. I lived near the Arctic Circle in Norway. One summer my friend and I made up our minds to take a boat trip together and go as far as we could into the North Country. So we put one month's food provisions in a small fishing boat and with sail and also a good engine in our boat we set to sea. At the end of one month we had traveled far into the north, beyond the pole and into a strange new country. We were so much astonished at the weather there. Warm and at times at night it was almost too warm to sleep. Then we saw something so strange that we both were astonished. Ahead of the warm open sea, we were on what looked like a great mountain. Into that mountain at a certain point the ocean seemed to be emptying. Mystified, we continued in that direction and found ourselves sailing into a vast canyon leading into the interior of the earth. We kept sailing and then we saw what surprised us, a sun shining inside the earth. These men eventually sailed into a land in the interior of the earth. They encountered many gigantic people and animals and a very advanced civilization. They spent their time there for a year before they returned back home. A Welshman, Walter Mapes, in the latter part of the 12th century, in his collection of anecdotes, tells of a prehistoric king of Britain named Hela, who met with the Skrelings, who took him beneath the earth. Many early legends tell of people going under the earth into a strange realm, staying there for a long period of time, and later returning. The ancient Irish had a legend of a land beyond the sea where the sun always shone and it was always summer weather. They even thought that some of their heroes had gone there and returned, after which they were never satisfied with their own country. With all the information that we've presented to you, all the speculation, and the facts supposedly based on speculation. If there were an inner world, is it possible that an explorer or two had gotten down through the well-traveled waterways, the islands that were so well documented again and again? Is it possible that an explorer had gotten to the inner world and made it out and actually mapped the inner world? We think it is. And behold, Schlaraffenland. This is an extremely unusual map. The cartographers and cartologists do not know really what it is of, other than they say it is a fantasy map. Our dealings with experts have taught us time and time again that when an expert does not know what something is, he dogmatically states that it is fantasy. But is this map fantasy? Let's look at a couple of aspects concerning this map. First of all, the origin of this map is somewhat questionable. It is a map craft crafted by George Matthias Souter, who lived from 1668 to 1757. This particular map was printed in 1740. It had supposedly reached Souter's hands in the early 1730s, where he held on to it before he published it in his atlases. It is scripted in Old German, not Latin. Souter's masters always scribed in Latin, for Souter always scribed in German, making him one of the first cartographers that used German as his language. Souter also commanded an excellent authority mapping Northern Europe and North America.
The map was supposedly the original map, which this engraving was taken from, was supposedly dropped off at Mr. Souter's map shop outside the door and left with no information or anything. There is evidence that there was a book printed in the early 1730s of over 400 pages talking about the geographies of this land, the rivers and the streams. And we can easily see that there is perhaps two-thirds land here and one-third water. Now, let's look at this map a little closer. We're going to start down here in the far left-hand corner. You will notice not one, not two, but three measurement graduations. This is very important, as why would someone include three measurements on a map that was supposedly mythological? Nowhere on the map is indicated as fantasy. It is, however, spoken of as utopia. The land area to the top is all happiness, virtue, heavenly, spiritual. And as we come down, the map gets more satirical bad evil becomes prevalent and then we have a lot of sadness and we have grief and we have terror horror and evil towards the bottom the cities the countries the names of the provinces all indicate this but could that have been because of an imposition of language difference could the names come from a phonetic sound alike rather than a true meaning? Up in the top, we see several different places where scripting is. These are scripture from the Sermon on the Mount. They exist here, 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 and over here, here, and right here in the center, we have New Jerusalem. This would indicate that Matthias Souter was not Catholic, that he was Protestant, given also to the fact that he used German instead of Latin, which was still widely recognized as the language of maps. We'd also like to point out at this time that this map is on page 335 of the Map Maker's Art book by Rand McNally which can be purchased at most any bookstore. It's page 335 and 336. Now Part of the reason why cartographers think this is a fantasy map is because of the meridian lines across the top and the bottom. But here in this corner, we start with 360, 370, 380, 390, 400, 10, 20, 30, 40, all the way up to 540. Now we showed you on earlier maps of the Northern Hemisphere plainly where there were six, 360 degrees and then we came back to zero and started again and could this be 360 here and since the craftsman of this map didn't know which way to go he just added to what he thought an inner earth would be he wouldn't it make sense that he just started from where he knew was a finite point and continue The equator, across the middle, 
in proportion to the Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cancer appear much more close in, thereby indicating that the map scale is somewhat thrown off. But is it possible that this map is just simply inverted? It almost gives the appearance of being inverted. The way the lines come up this way with the sharpness of the angle. Let's look a little closer to some of the script on this map. Down here we can close in. Supposedly all the script on this map is satirical. Right here it says in these waters the fishing for mackerel and herring is good. We would say that that was significant. And let's come over to this line right here which we find very very interesting. It is a description of this island right here. Right here it says, this is the island where the machine that controls the weather is located. Now if somebody printed this and engraved it in 1730, how ridiculous that would have been. Controlling the weather is something that's even new to us today. And now, we're going to point out something else. This script right here, written just below the equator, says basically, the sun is the same both day and night, all the time. Or the light is the same both day and night. None of the books indicate what the legend here says down in the far right hand corner. But we're going to read this. We're going to look at it and see what it says there. Let me translate to you what the script in this box says. Script right here describes a utopian map of the newly discovered Schlaraffenland. This land was often spoken of, but never actually located. Also makes a comment that this ridiculous fantasy land supposedly is composed of many kingdoms which have all the different vices of life within them. And that this map was delivered by anonymous authors. The Schlaraffenland, often spoken of, but never located, or nobody knows where it is. We look at, look at this map here, the so-called fantasy map. Could this map here give a clue of how to get to the Schlaraffenland? I believe it does. Let us take a look at this. As you notice, this looks like a very high mountain. And notice the rivers flowing right into the mountain. One here, have another one there, and another one going in here. All these rivers flowing right into the mountain. Now from what we have shown you previously, does this not remind you of what is on the map of Gerard Mercator in Matthias Quarters? This might be a clue of how to get to the Schlaraffenland and that this is a map of a portion of the inner world. So where does all of the solid core theory come from? Perhaps if we look around, we can get to the core of the core. 
let's look at All right now we're going to show you another map from the 1600s 1665 this is a Kircher map system of underground water pretty much is what it says here and let's back up and we can see this guy oh it's very beautiful black and white print this is the original Athanasius Kircher and this was sanctioned by the Catholic Church Kircher was a Jesuit scholar and basically what we have is down here a description of the subterranean water system the chain of events happens like this the ocean drains into the center of the earth and then there's a an immense heat immense heat source here water heats up pushes to the outside to the tops of these mountains where the water then cools and then flows back down through the valleys as rivers and streams back into the ocean and then the cycle continues this was a dogma presented and sanctioned by the Catholic Church we also want to point out at this time that the year after this map was printed <clears throat> in 1666 Kircher was presented with the Voynich manuscript from the University of Prague they gave it to him in hopes that he could break the code but he was unable to translate the manuscript so he sent it on to the Jesuit College and remember Dr. John Dee the 16th century occultist he also had the Voynich manuscripts he couldn't decipher them either and he later became Queen Elizabeth I's secret agent, her private attache, liaison. And when he sent her private letters, he always signed them 007. Let's look at another Kircher map. Now we have the sister map to the one we just showed you. This basically says what lies beneath the mountains and volcanoes, or the system that lies beneath the mountains and volcanoes. very beautiful this is the original and you'll see there's a lot of Latin script here and basically in short what it suggests is the following that the central core here is an immense heat source and there are sub cores or subordinate cores that heat up the gases build up pressure and push them out the volcanoes now you may ask how could the Catholic Church have so much say so over the political dogmas and how they affect what people think but Copernicus who lived from 1473 to about 1543 or so stated that the planets revolved around the Sun he caught hell from the church them, them saying that this was not scriptural and also again Galileo who lived 1564 to 1649 also said the Sun did not rotate around the earth and in 1616 Galileo was tried and convicted for teaching the Sun was the center of the planetary system he was persecuted by the church We have done our very best to present to you documented history, gleaning a lot of information from the Mapmaker's Art by Rand McNally, John Goss, also the mapping of North America. Is there cause to question what we've been taught? Is it possible that there is another side to the story? We think so, and we hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you.
you managed to stay with us this long. We've got a bone we want to throw at you. What you're looking at is the oldest copy, the oldest manuscript in the world that details the continent of Atlantis. This is also from the mid-1600s by Kircher, the Jesuit scholar. We didn't feature it tonight or in this presentation because we could have spent two hours just on it. And it's still being transcribed from Latin. And uh, we don't really believe that you would have that you would have uh, believed it. So it's just a bone. If you can back it up there, not only do we have that, but out of the same book, we have ten pages of documents, all in Latin, and all totally unbelievable. And now we're going to just take a cruise through the rest, some of the other maps included in the Lazy Library. And we'll be enjoying the music of Fred Schindel and Glass Hammer.
much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned, and we'll see you back next time.